Hello and welcome back. We're in Matthew chapter 12 where Jesus talks about the Queen of the South, that's the Queen of Sheba mentioned in the Old Testament. And this account is also found in Luke chapter 11. But let's read a few verses from Matthew 12 starting in verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay, so death, burial and resurrection, or at least the burial part is explicitly mentioned here. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because of the death, burial and resurrection. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold a greater than Jonas is here. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold a greater than Solomon is here. So Jesus is telling us that the Queen of Sheba was saved. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with Christ and with the brethren, the saved, and Jesus shall judge the ungodly and shall condemn them. So Christ is coming back to judge the earth and those risen in Christ will stand with him without condemnation because Christ is the resurrection. Let's go over to the Old Testament account of the Queen of Sheba. There's two accounts, one in 1st Kings chapter 10 and the other in 2nd Chronicles chapter 9. Now we'll look at the account in 1st Kings chapter 10. They're very similar accounts. It's worth cross-referencing them if you need to. But I think we only need really to go through one of the accounts here today. So the Queen of the South is the Queen of Sheba. She's the one that went up from her land to seek out Solomon and his words and his wisdom. So I did do a recording on this yesterday. I slept on that recording and I'm glad I did. Never underestimate the power of the scriptures and the Holy Spirit to work on our minds and understanding in our quieter moments, including sleep, and the reason I say I'm glad I slept on it before putting out the recording I did yesterday is because I think, well I know, that I was a little harsh in my assessment of Sheba or the Queen of Sheba in some of the things I said. And I'll just explain quickly because it might give some actual little bit of context here. So she came to prove him Solomon with hard questions. So I assessed that she'd come to prove him wrong because she's either going to prove him right or wrong. Did she come to prove him right or did she come to prove him wrong? Um, I don't think that's actually a good way of looking at these scriptures. On hindsight the scriptures also say 
that when the Queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he built, etc., there was no more spirit in her. So I kind of stated that she'd come with an antichrist spirit to disprove Solomon. She says in her own words here, Howbeit I believed not the words, the words she had heard, she says, It was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts and thy wisdom, Howbeit I believed not the words until I came, and so on and so forth. We'll go through these scriptures in a bit more detail. So, I'd kind of assessed, maybe unfairly, that she, she was an unbeliever coming in a, a spirit of Antichrist to prove Solomon wrong with hard questions, but I'm now led to believe that that's, whilst that may not be totally untrue, I don't think it's really what the scripture's telling us. So let's go through this. There's about 13 verses. I don't think it will take too long. So I just want to put this in a little bit of context from the previous chapter, 1 Kings 9. Hiram, the king of Tyre, so was in a a kind of business covenant, a business relationship with Solomon concerning materials, cedar trees, fir trees, gold, etc. Solomon gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. So there is this relationship that's formed between Solomon and Hiram. He's the king of Tyre, which is a pagan nation. And then down towards the end of the chapter, we've got. So Solomon, King Solomon made a navy of ships in Ezion Geber, which is by Eloth on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. And Hiram sent in the navy of his ships, shipmen that had knowledge of the sea, with the servants of Solomon. And they came to Ophir, and fetched from thence gold, 420 talents, and brought it to King Solomon. So, now this place, Ophir, there's a great deal of debate on that, uh, which I don't want to get into. Some people believe it's in Africa, other people believe it's in India. Wherever it is, it's probably some good way from the Red Sea going out into the greater ocean, whether north or south. And it took shipmen that had knowledge of the sea so maybe it is in India, um, you'll get different results looking for it according to who believes what, um, but uh, you know, wherever it was, this is kind of epic, you know, this is a, a joint operation of quite epic proportions. So. These, these two kings, Solomon and Hiram, are doing massive amounts of business. This is noticeable to the wider world, what's going on here. Uh, sending out ships and bringing back large quantities of gold, trading in, well, they were trading in cedar trees, fir trees, lots and lots of building materials. 
Um, they were doing this for the building of the, the temple, the house of the Lord, and the king's house. So these things didn't go unnoticed, especially to other monarchs. So in First Kings chapter 10, and when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, now look at that, concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. So although there was all this business going on, building of navies, I mean, this isn't just building a few ships. Hiram and Solomon together formed an alliance to build a navy. They were doing long sea journeys because their shipmen needed knowledge of the seas. So these weren't local trips where most merchants would have knowledge of the local waters. These were bigger ventures. But this is important because 1 Kings 10.1 tells us when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. So we don't have her intention here. She's come to prove him. In other words, to find out the truth one way or the other. Scripture doesn't say she came to prove him right or to prove him wrong. I think it would be a bit of a mistake to read that into the scripture. She came to prove him with hard questions. So she has come in search of truth. Whether Solomon is correct concerning his God, which is our God, or whether he is wrong. She's come, scripture simply says, she came to prove him with hard questions. So her mindset isn't that she's gonna be turned away without answers. Okay, I think that's important to understand. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train. That's a caravan of travellers, a procession of people and animals and goods, etc. She came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. Now she's coming with gifts. So she means business. She means business and I mean that in the broadest sense of the word. Spices and precious stones were expensive and very much gold. So She's showing her intention that this is serious business between one monarch, queen of a nation, and another monarch, Solomon, the king of Israel. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all, and all means all, all that was in her heart. So, her feelings, intentions, motives, motivations, all that was in her heart, she communed with him, she communicated everything that was on her mind, in her heart. And this is actually very good news for this queen 
because she's not come in deception. She's not come with ill intent. She's come showing that she means business in all seriousness with the things that she's brought a very great train. She's come in very great seriousness with a very great train. So she's got her people, maybe her family even, definitely her servants that are bearing or the camel leaders that are coming bearing spices, gold, precious stones. She has come seeking answers concerning concerning the name of the Lord. She's not going to leave readily or happily without proof of God one way or the other. And Solomon told her all her questions. Now isn't that interesting? Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. Now why would scripture word that in such a way? When scripture could easily be telling us that Solomon answered all her questions, responded to all her questions, satisfied all her questions. No, scripture says Solomon told her all her questions. Did Solomon preempt her questions? I believe there's an inference that he did. She communed with him of all that was in her heart. So her intentions, her feelings, her desire to know the things concerning the name of the Lord, concerning Solomon's God. She communed with him her desire to, to know truth. And Solomon told her all her questions, so she hadn't yet asked her questions. She communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. Is this possible that he's preempting with the understanding of what's on her heart or in her heart? Has he preempted her questions? And I believe through the power of God, he has. So Jesus, you know the scripture, Jesus in Matthew 6 verses 7 and 8 says, When ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Jesus tells us that those that pray to the Father, He, the Father, knows the things that we need before we ask. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus speaking to the disciples, he said to his disciples, 
Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, etc. I'm sure you know this scripture. Consider the lilies, etc. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye, neither be ye doubtful of mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Okay, the Father knows the needs of those that seek Him, that those that come to Him, and those that have faith in Him. Even, O ye of little faith. So, when Sheba, or the Queen of Sheba, I should say, When she was come to Solomon, she has come to the one on earth who is representing God. We, we need to understand this. He is the figurehead in Jerusalem. He is the figurehead, the king in Jerusalem. He's there as King of Jerusalem in place of the coming Christ. He represents Christ. Look, let's go to Ecclesiastes one moment. Ecclesiastes 1.1 1, 1, The words of the preacher, the son of David, King in Jerusalem. Okay. So Ecclesiastes written by Solomon. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now, Solomon was the preacher, but here we have the preacher capitalized, referring to Christ. It's a double meaning, okay? Ecclesiastes written through Solomon by the divine inspiration of God, through the Holy Spirit, the words of God written down by Solomon pertaining to the things of Christ. So the words of the preacher twofold. Solomon who's writing the book and the preacher pointing forward to Christ to come. The words of the preacher, the son of David, that's Solomon, king in Jerusalem, that's Solomon, okay? Solomon, Solomon, Solomon. But let's have a look at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1 verse 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the preacher, the son of David, the son of Abraham okay Jesus Christ the son of David king of Jerusalem the one that's coming back to rule on the earth future prophetic So, when she was come to Solomon, she came to prove him with hard questions 
concerning the name of the Lord. Are you getting this? So Solomon is God's representative on earth. So if it were possible, she would go directly to the Lord. But she's going to the Lord's representative on earth at this time, Solomon, to approve him with hard questions. And there's nothing wrong with asking hard questions of God because he's more than capable of answering hard questions. And she communed with him of all that was in her heart. So this is a good position. She's actually come in a very good position with an open heart, with an honest, upfront position. And of course, the things that she comes with bearing spices much gold and precious stones to offer to Solomon who is God's representative on earth so she's making offering really concerning the name of the Lord she's making offering to the Lord to prove one way or the other if he is true or just another pagan God So Solomon told her all her questions and I do think this is a preemption when she communed with him of all that was in her heart. How would he respond? He would know, he would preach the gospel, telling her all her questions because all her questions would be concerning the gospel. as the preacher, as God's representative on earth, he would know of her needs before she asked and everyone's primary need is the gospel. There was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. And when the Queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built. Now think about this, the house that he had built was the temple. So she's hearing firsthand Solomon's wisdom which is the gospel because she heard of his fame concerning the name of the Lord and she's seeing with all the wealth and connections and the trade and other kings the building of navies and everything else and all the gold that's pouring into his kingdom she's seeing what he's spending it on he's spending it all on God it's all for the building of the temple so the two things are connected all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built and the meat of his table and the sitting of his servants and the attendants the attendance of his ministers and their apparel and his cup bearers see this is all to do with ministry and praise and worship of God it's not for Solomon's benefit and his ascent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord 
there was no more spirit in her now that's where we could become a little unstuck and believe that her spirit was somehow arrogant that she was come to debunk or disprove the God of Solomon and David but actually this is quite normal there was no more spirit in her so so this is something that happens to all believers upon belief there's a regeneration of the spirit it's no longer our spirit alone but God's spirit that resides in us and look as soon as soon as this happens what and she said to the king it was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom so this is talking about the spirit of man it's not necessarily a spirit of antichrist this is just she's believed and been regenerated in the spirit it was a true report that I heard in mine own land so she's heard of all these things the physical material things the coming together of Hiram and Solomon of the building of the navy and the the wealth that's coming into Israel and the building of the temple it was a true report that she heard of his acts but also of his wisdom and again I can't express how important this is in verse 1 concerning the name of the Lord so the fame of Solomon which would include his acts and his wisdom concerning the name of the Lord Howbeit I believed not the words until I came and mine eyes had seen it and behold the half was not told me thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard so it would be very easy to think of this as worldly wisdom and worldly prosperity but we know that's not the case the wisdom of Solomon came from God and he is now expressing sharing that wisdom happy are thy men happy are thy men happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee and let hear thy wisdom is she implying that back in her own kingdom in her own nation in her own palace or whatever it is she has there is she implying that her own men and servants are not happy and standing continually before her and listening to her it would seem like there's a comparison because she says blessed be the Lord thy God which delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever therefore made he the king to do judgment and justice now this is so loaded 
so so loaded she's blessing the lord the lord thy god which delighted in thee so she's not just seeing a man that's delighting in his god she's seeing a god that's delighting in solomon his servant can you see how important this is she's come with questions she's received answers and she's believed and now she's understanding this and she's giving glory to God not just because Solomon delights in God but because she can see that God delights in his servant Solomon thy God the Lord thy God which delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel see she must be seeing something different they're both monarchs Queen of Sheba and the King of Israel they're both monarchs so she probably came believing they were equals and she's seeing that they're not and here's a real kicker because the Lord loved Israel for ever now look at this the Lord loved so there's a past tense sense about this because the Lord loved Israel forever this here is massive because that's the whole history of Israelites of believers she is affirming to Solomon the history of God's people past present and future because the Lord loved Israel forever therefore made he the king to do judgment and justice so actually this is important because this confirms therefore made he God the Solomon King this confirms that this verse here is a continuation of the words she's speaking not just a little side note added about God or about Solomon this is part of her speech Queen of Sheba speaking to Solomon about God's relationship with Solomon therefore made he the king to do judgment and justice so not only is she acknowledging Solomon as a judge over his nation but she adds the word justice in there as well to do judgment and justice so his judgment is real it's fair it's godly it's correct then she gave the king 120 talents of gold that's a lot of gold and of spices very great store it's a lot of spices and precious stones there came no more such abundance of spices as these which the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon there came no more such abundance of spices as these which the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon that's massive that means in the whole of the history 
of Israel. The whole of the history of Jerusalem, of Israel. There was never other, never. There was never ever such a gift in abundance from a neighbour or a, a fellow monarch or anyone. And the navy also of Hiram, this is why I went back into 1 Kings 9 earlier, to give some context on this. The navy also of Hiram that brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir great plenty of almug trees and precious stones again precious stones and the king made of the almug trees pillars for the house of the Lord and for the king's house harps also and psalteries for singers there came no such almug trees nor were seen unto this day and King Solomon gave unto the Queen of Sheba all her desire whatsoever she asked beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty so she turned and went to her own country she and her servants so King Solomon gave unto the Queen of Sheba all her desire so her desire is here look she came to prove him with hard questions she communed with him of all that was in her heart and it's all here concerning the name of the Lord again we should understand this in gospel terms we should understand this in spiritual terms because scripture tells us to King Solomon gave unto the Queen of Sheba all her desire whatsoever she asked she was asking about the gospel beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty there's the material there so this is spiritual this is a concerning the gospel now look happy are thy men happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee and that hear thy wisdom the wisdom is the gospel we need to understand this proverbs also written by solomon proverbs eleven thirty. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise. Remember Solomon wrote this. Solomon who God called the wisest man to walk the earth with the exception of Christ. He was the wisest of all God's servants, prophets, apostles, etc. Solomon, scripture tells us Solomon was the wisest. And Solomon writes, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise. So we know that the wisdom is connected to the gospel the it's the gospel that saves 
and the wisdom is the preaching of the gospel. So these men, Solomon's servants, are happy and stand before him continually and hear his wisdom. So Solomon, this great and mighty king who is known amongst all the nations, he receives, he receives monarchs, leaders, ambassadors, people of all kinds, merchants, the rich, he's receiving people coming to him, people that want to make alliances, people that want to do trade, people that want to be associated with this kingdom because there was never a time when the kingdom, the land, the nation of Israel was more prosperous than this. Israel as a nation prospered most greatly under David and Solomon. So all these neighbouring monarchs are hearing about his wealth, his wisdom, his works, etc. They're coming to him to make alliances, to make trade. He's entertaining many. And what's Solomon doing? Oh, he's just being a king and preaching the gospel. How many people came to him as unbelievers and left the nation as believers? Well, Sheba did. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. So she turned, she's turned, there's a turning. She came as an unbeliever seeking answers, seeking truth, and she turned, she turned from coming in as an unbeliever to leaving as a believer. So she turned and went to her own country. She and her servants, this is what Solomon was doing. When he sent people away, back to their own countries, he was sending them out with the gospel. So look, Queen of Sheba says, it was a true report that I heard in mine own land, in mine own land, so the things concerning Solomon and the Lord and the name of the Lord, they were being widely spoken. She says, I believed not the words, I believed not the words until I came. And mine eyes had seen it, and behold, the half was not told me. So she'd heard of the gospel. She'd probably heard the gospel in some form. And went directly to the source of that gospel, which at the time was Solomon, son of David, king of Jerusalem, for the truth of it. I mean, even knowing or hearing half, half of the truth, half of the things concerning the name of the Lord, it was enough. Why hadn't she heard the gospel in her own land? 
She's a queen. She's a queen. Remember what Jesus said? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I'm paraphrasing that a little bit. Who's going to tell the queen the full story? Who's going to tell the queen with all her power and might and authority that she's a sinner in need of redemption? Who's going to tell the queen that? We don't know what type of queen she was before she came to Solomon. We don't know about her rule, her nation, her culture. But the gospel would certainly be foreign and offensive. Would any of her own people actually be entertained by the Queen? Would someone with the Gospel even get an audience with the Queen? Let alone tell her she's a sinner in need of redemption, in need of salvation, in need of turning to another God, a God that would be foreign to her. You see, she needed to go to Solomon to hear it. But I do believe she went with an openness of heart, an honesty, a, a truthful intention to seek out the truth and to find answers and to prove him, to prove him one way or the other. I think she was always going to she was always going to accept truth if it was made plain for her. All these things were stacked in her favour because she was willing to hear, to see, to believe. Amen. So, so I wouldn't be inclined to treat the Queen of Sheba harshly because she came to prove him with hard questions. I don't think that's anything nefarious or in any way malefficient or malign. I think God, God welcomes hard questions. And so did Solomon. There's nothing wrong with asking hard questions or being asked hard questions. We're not, it's not something we should shy away from. There's actually nothing in this passage or in the other accounts in Second Chronicles chapter 9 which I'd urge you to go and cross-reference, there's not a lot of difference. But there's nothing in these passages to suggest that she had any particular ill intention. And I think those that preach that she came with some kind of bad or ill intention and not really taking the time to read the text for what it says so anyway she was saved as Jesus said and as Solomon shows here and as she in her own words say here Amen so I'll leave that there I hope that's been somewhat interesting until the next time the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all
Amen.